Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to read this morning from verses 38 through 42, though we will be focused on verse 42. This is the word of the Lord. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, Something greater than Solomon is here. I want to speak to you this morning on one greater than Solomon. I've broken the message into three parts, some introductory comments just to set the stage so we can rightly understand this passage before us. And then I'll give some historical background, some Old Testament help from the book of Second Chronicles. And then I'll make application, draw application from the text. Four things I want to say about verse 42. So let me pray. Father, You are the divine author of Scripture. You are the divine author and finisher of our faith. Lord, in reality, You're the author of everything. You're accomplishing all Your purposes. You do all your holy will. We are your subjects, merely created beings. As Mac spoke to the children, sin is in us. Lord, we are those that need to be redeemed. And then as redeemed vessels, we need to be washed and purified and sanctified. Father, come. Give help to us now that we could truly understand the Scriptures and that in them we could find meat and drink. Come Holy Spirit, illumine minds. Quicken every human heart. Father, we plead with you to save the unconverted before it's too late. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Introductory comments. Let's just walk through a refresher of the life of Jesus Christ on display for us, not in one gospel, but in four gospel accounts. If we recall from Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the very beginning, the very start of the public ministry of our Lord and Savior, He opens His mouth and begins to proclaim a message He will proclaim all the way to the cross. And the message is this. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's where Jesus starts. That's where Jesus finishes. It's one message for all time. Our Savior is extremely clear. The call to every man today, Darius could read it from Acts 17. Matt could share it with the little children this morning. The call to everyone today is still the same. Repent and believe the gospel. This is the only way a dead man, one sold into slavery in sin, can be made alive, can be made a new creature, can know the forgiveness of sins. It's not through sacraments. It's not through religious behavior. It is through the power of Jesus Christ to rescue sinners. This is how Jesus begins. We see this picture, whether we're reading Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, that 
everywhere Jesus went, He was teaching. He was lifting up His voice. This was the chief instrument that our Savior used. His lips, His voice. He was being heard. He was teaching the people. He was healing many. He was calling all men to come to Him. Matthew captures this in the fourth chapter where he says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. This was the ministry of our Lord. But how was his ministry received? Was he applauded as the great and long anticipated hero in Israel? No, he was not. Did that rejection deter him in his mission? No, it did not. Think of the inviting way as Jesus was teaching, whether it was the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon in the Plain, whether it was a sermon to few or a sermon to multitudes. Think of the inviting way Jesus describes to his hearers why he came from heaven in the first place. John 10.10, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. John 12.46, I have come into the world as a light so that whoever believes in Me may not remain in darkness. Matthew 9.13, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus was open as to why He came. He was open as to why He was doing what He was doing. He must speak. He must lift up His voice because this is the reason why He came. This is the reason why God sent Him. And and He didn't come speaking harshly to needy sinners. He came with warm compassion. He came with tender invitations. Now, He spoke harshly at times, didn't He? And it was to needy sinners. But it was to a certain type of needy sinner. Those that were extremely religious. Well versed in the Scriptures even. It was to them that He had the harshest words. The most condemning speech. But generally, to the needy neighbor, to the afflicted, impoverished Jerusalem resident, Jesus had tender words of affection. Think of the many compassionate invitations that the Lord Jesus gave, calling people to come to Him. Matthew 11, 28, Come to Me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John 7, 37, If anyone thirsts, Let him come to me and drink. To the woman at the well in John 4, if you had asked of me, I would give it. In Matthew 4, come, follow me. In Matthew 19, let the little children come to me. In Matthew 22, in a parabolic way, come, Jesus says, to the wedding feast. It is ready. This was the compassionate heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, indeed, the God-man. Not not merely God's representative, though certainly He represented God in the earth, but unlike no other. He was not God's representative like Moses. No, he was altogether different than Moses. He was not God's representative like Elijah. No, he was altogether different than Elijah. This was the God-man. This was the eternal Word, the eternal Son who had taken on flesh. And now the very God, Emmanuel, was amongst us. It was His voice that people were hearing in the earth. So now we come to the chapter before us today. And we see in Matthew chapter 12 that the Lord is encountering hostility. He's encountering arguments. 
He's encountering unbelieving Jews, religious hypocrites that are trying to poke holes in his ministry, in his message. They're trying to find some way under heaven that they can condemn this loud-spoken one and shut him down. And Jesus has some interesting ways in which he engages these unbelieving Jews, these religious hypocrites. And before we get to verses 38 through 42, I want to point out one other verse in this chapter, verse 6, where Jesus says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Now, why am I pointing that out? Well, hopefully you were listening when I read verses 38 through 42, and we see this formula and these words now three times in a single chapter, something greater than. And Jesus speaks of three things. In verse 6, He speaks of something greater than the temple. What, what's so special about the temple? Well, the temple was ultra special in the eyes of Israel, wasn't it? There really wasn't anything more special or more cherished. And why? Was it the gold? Was it the sacrifices? No. This was where God had said He would dwell among them. So when we think of the temple in the eyes of Israel, we have to see that this was the heart of their worship. This was the center of religious worship in their day. Why? Because God had promised to dwell there. Well, Jesus now says, wait a minute, something greater than the temple is here. He's not concerned about buildings anymore. He doesn't need this special kind of worship and sacrifice. He's here in the flesh. It's not about Jerusalem anymore. I am God Almighty. I'm among you. Something greater than the temple is here. And then we see in verse 41, Jesus makes another comment following the formula, something greater than, and it's something greater than Jonah is here. Now when we think of Jonah, it's such a, a short book, a minor prophet, four chapters, but I think all of us are familiar enough with the story to where we see one who was sinfully disobedient. And upon his sinful disobedience and his flight from the will of God and the purposes of God, he is swallowed by a great fish. The text in the New Testament tells us, make a note, Jesus has no problem with the story of Jonah. And then God radically delivers this prophet. It's pretty radical, isn't it? Spit out on the beach, there to preach to Nineveh. And then he's wonderfully used. So Jonah does stand out amongst prophets in a few different ways. And Jesus says, something greater than Jonah is here. You mean Jonah who preached in Nineveh and they all repented? Yes, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus Christ is the prophet of prophets. Jonah was proclaiming God's truth. Jesus says, I am God's truth. I stand among you. And then we come to the third use of this formula, something greater than. And that's our text today. Something greater than Solomon is here. Greater than Solomon? <laughs> yes, greater than Solomon. Who's Solomon? Oh, just the most wise, knowledgeable, and prosperous king in the Old Testament. In all of Israel's history, he would be looked at as the one who had the purest, brightest, most peaceful reign. Yes, that Solomon. A great king. Something greater than Solomon is here. Solomon ruled a near eastern country for the space of 40 years. Jesus Christ says, I am the king of kings. I am the king of the universe. I have ruled what you know is the universe from the beginning. Something greater than Solomon is here. A couple other notes, and then we're going to dig into some background. It seems that in verses 41 and 42, the, 
the back-to-back statements of something greater than. That it's almost as if Jesus is working from a lesser example to a greater example. And why is that? Well, in the example of Jonah, whom God sent to go preach repentance to the Ninevites, what's the picture? God raises up the prophet, sends the prophet to the pagan city. He preaches there. God gives tremendous results. The people repent. But a prophet is sent to them. And then the greater example, a queen from the south. No prophet is sent to the queen. She hears reports of a great king from the north by the name of Solomon. And she's going to make a long, arduous journey to go see him. She's even a greater example. Jesus is communicating, yes, indeed, something greater than Jonah is here. One who preached repentance and the Ninevites received it. And hey, at the judgment... They're going to speak against you. Why? Because they heeded God's Word and repented. The Queen of the South will one day stand in judgment against you. Why? Here's the greater example. Because she sought Solomon out. And when she saw him, when she heard his wisdom, she embraced every ounce of it. That's why she'll stand in judgment against you. Two things are coupled together here. Repentance. And then a seeking of the Lord, of believing in Him. The audience that Jesus was communicating these things to are refusing His truth. They're rejecting His ministry. And Jesus rebukes them in the text before us today. Turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 9. Let me give some Old Testament background on who the Queen of the South is and what Jesus is really communicating here. Remember, He's speaking to a people that knew exactly who the Queen of the South was. They had read Second Chronicles 9 in the Tanakh many times. Maybe some of them had it memorized. I'll read the first nine verses. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon... She came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions, having a very great retinue and camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from Solomon that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials and the attendance of his servants and their clothing, his cupbearers and their clothing, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came. And my own eyes had seen it. And behold, half the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You surpass the reports that I heard. Happy are your wives. Happy are these your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on His throne as King for the Lord your God. Because your God loved Israel and would establish them forever, He has made you king over them, that you may execute justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold, nine thousand pounds of gold, and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. There were no spices such as those that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Jesus refers to her as the Queen of the South who came from the ends of the earth to see Solomon. And we understand that the Queen of the South is indeed the Queen of Sheba. When we see these phrases that are hyperbole or idioms from the ends of the earth, Jesus says, we understand 
him to mean that she traveled extremely long distance to see this king. This is not a neighboring sovereign. By the best accounts of reputable church historians, they understand that Sheba was likely a territory in Arabia, possibly modern-day Yemen, possibly in Ethiopia. If either of these three locations are accurate, this queen traveled between 1,200 and 1,600 miles to see King Solomon in his day. Rough terrain, leaving her own kingdom, she travels because she's heard reports of this great ruler. You read Second Chronicles 9 and it's, it's fabulous because you can see that she has come loaded with a lot of questions, right? And, and from the get-go, we see that she told him all that was on her heart. I mean, she just dropped the load at the feet of this wise king and says, help me. I want to learn. I want to understand. I need answers. And Solomon, fully capable by the hand of God, answers every question. There's such myth about the Queen of Sheba. Whether she had a child with Solomon or not, we may never know. But there's certainly details surrounding that idea. Whether she was inquisitive and tested Solomon, as some accounts say, we may never know. But there is an account where she came and brought before Solomon two pots with flowers, both beautiful One a living flower, one not. It was fake. And she said, tell me which one is the real one. And Solomon in his wisdom said, open the windows. Windows were opened and the bee came in and rested on the living flower. And he said, that's the one. If that's a real account, we don't know. We get glimpses in the Old Testament Scriptures of Solomon's wisdom. We have factually from the mouth of God that Solomon is indeed the wisest king to ever live. What was it that sparked this interest in this queen of the south to make such a journey in the first place? Well, the Scriptures tell us, both Jesus tells us, and here in this account of 2 Chronicles, we see that she heard of the fame or the wisdom of Solomon. Likely this took place through traders that were visiting her land. Ships coming in and off the coast. Reports from distant kingdoms shared amongst the people, amongst the traders. And here this name keeps popping up. Solomon, king of Israel. She's intrigued. Intrigued enough to leave her kingdom. Travel. 1,200 to 1,600 miles to see Him. And when she sees Him, when she hears His wisdom, when she unloads all her cares and inquiries before Him and finds answers and finds solace and finds knowledge, she stands amazed. I love the ESV translation at the end of verse 4. There was no more breath in her. That does not mean she was exhausted of speaking. That means she was lost in amazement and didn't even know what to say. And then if we didn't get the ending of verse 4, she clarifies in her own verbal report in verse 6, you surpass the report that I heard. There's the history in the Old Testament background. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 12. Why do we need all that? It's so we can rightly understand what Jesus is communicating to a group of unbelieving Jews in His own day. I'll read the verse again. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. 
And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. There's four truths I want to draw from the text. And you can write them down and I'll expand upon them. Four words that I'll elaborate on. Number one, unbelief. Number two, beauty. Number three, necessity. Number four, urgency. When we think of unbelief, we see it now, I hope, in the context. Why is Jesus even responding this way? It's because He's responding to unbelieving Jews that are hearing Him speak, that are seeing His ministry, that are following His life, and yet they are rejecting Him. As the prophet Isaiah prophesied, we esteem Him not. He was despised and rejected by men. It's as if Jesus is saying to them in this text, you don't even have to take a journey. I'm standing here before you and you still don't care. In some sense, hearers, Jesus Christ in His Word this morning is standing here before you. Do you care? Will you hear Him? There's a phrase, seeing is believing. And in some sense, when we read Second Chronicles 9, that seems to be true for the Queen of the South, doesn't it? I, I didn't believe the reports that I heard back at home. But now that I have come, that I've seen you, I believe. And I didn't even hear half of the greatness of you, King Solomon. But seeing isn't always believing, is it? Because here, these unbelieving Jews are beholding one greater than Solomon. And they want nothing to do with Him. And, and not just that, they want to crucify Him. They are listening here and in their hearts and minds plotting how they might kill this man. Destroy his ministry. Well, unbelief has always been prevalent in the world. Ever since the incident that Max spoke of in Genesis 3 with the fall, unbelief has been alive and well. Today, it is no different than it was in Jesus' day. We as humankind are no better off today in the realm of faith and believing Christ than we were in Jesus' day. He was speaking to unbelieving Jews in His context, and today we speak to unbelieving Americans in our context. Whether that's family members, whether that's co-workers, rather than that's those that even visit our congregation on a Sunday morning. Today men are ignoring Jesus Christ. They are smearing Jesus Christ. They are hating Jesus Christ. They are refusing to believe in the Gospel that Jesus Christ so faithfully proclaimed Unbelief is all around us. Nothing new under the sun. And so we shouldn't be surprised, saints, when we're surrounded by unbelief. Our Savior was surrounded by unbelief. We should not be weary and discouraged when we are surrounded by mockers and haters and persecutors. For our Lord said that if they despised Me, if they hated Me, they will hate you. I send you out as sheep amongst wolves. Be on guard. The amazement really shouldn't be that in the 21st century American context there are so many atheists. We should be amazed that there aren't more. God is merciful. He's saving atheists in the earth today. What a wonder that men believe at all. When we consider our hearts, as Mac again said, sin dwelling in us, what a wonder that any of us are here this morning believing the Gospel. We're products of the fall. We're children of Adam and Eve. And every one of us, down to the sweetest, tenderest, littlest baby, is infected with this deadly disease. Seeing unbelief may grieve us, saints, but it should never surprise us. Unbelief is everywhere. Secondly, 
beauty. I'm not talking about beauty that surrounds us everywhere. I'm talking about the surpassing beauty of Jesus Christ. We, we get that in the text. If, if we go back and we read 2 Chronicles 9 or 1 Kings 10, then we're, we're going to see what Jesus meant when He said, something greater than Solomon is here. Something more glorious than the most glorious Israelite king is among you right here and now. The phrase is, there was no more breath in her. The exclamation, you surpassed the report that I heard. These indicate that Solomon was rather awesome. And Jesus says, indeed he was. I made him that way, but something greater than Solomon is here. Something more awesome, a more grand display is here among you. Even Solomon himself in the Song of Solomon, the fifth chapter, points to the coming Messiah, describing him as the altogether lovely one. Solomon knew that he wasn't the most awesome. Jesus Christ is the great one. And when we talk about the surpassing beauty of Christ, saints, you may well feel this as I do, words simply fail, don't they? The most eloquent man could paint the brightest, clearest, most wonderful portrait for us today of who our Savior is in His person, in His works, in His glory, in His beauty. And it's as nothing compared to who He really is. But let's contrast together Solomon and the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, I said contrast. We're not comparing because there is no comparison. Solomon is a wise man. Jesus Christ is eternal wisdom. He is the only wise God. He is wisdom itself. Philip preached to us from Colossians 2 recently. Jesus Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Yes, Solomon, you knew some stuff. Jesus Christ is the fountain of that wisdom. Solomon, he's a great Israelite king. You can't argue with that. Read Second Chronicles 9. It's phenomenal. His wealth and the extent of his dominion. But Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. You could have 10,000 Solomons grouped together as one and they don't compare with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the great King. Solomon is a man of great power. And he was. Did you hear it in the text? Your servants. How orderly everything is. How remarkable everything is. He was a man of power. A man of authority. But Jesus is the all-powerful God. He speaks and things are created. With a thought, with a word, men are healed, men are transformed. Solomon can't touch that. He can have 10,000 servants. Jesus Christ owns us all. He's the all-powerful God. Solomon was a possessor of truth. Jesus Christ is the originator of truth. I am the way, the truth. And the life, Solomon would fall on his face before Jesus Christ in John 14, 6. I am nothing. You are everything. I know some truth. You've given me truth. You've dispensed it. But you are truth itself, King Jesus. Solomon was an owner of vast wealth. Vast it was. Even the gift that Sheba gives him, 9,000 pounds of gold. Do the math on that in today's monetary terms. But it's nothing. It's less than dust. Jesus Christ is the owner of everything. Not under heaven, but everything everywhere in the heavens and the earth. He has joy in it all. He has command of it all. It's His. Solomon was a worshiper of God. We see that in 2 Chronicles 9. Sheba, Queen of Sheba is watching him as he sacrifices animals to the Lord. 
in the house of the Lord. And that is a part of her amazement. The religious worship, the order of it all, the reverence of it all, the power, the glory of God in it all. Solomon is a worshiper of God, the text tells us. Jesus Christ is the God to be worshipped. Solomon is an intelligent man. He's an impressive man. Jesus Christ is the perfect God-man and the Savior of the most impressive men. There's an illustration that I've shared with several of you. A few of you yesterday, as a matter of fact. And it's the story of William Montague Dyke. This on the heels of the wedding just seemed right. When William Montague Dyke was ten years old, he was blinded in an accident. Despite his disability, William graduated from a university in England with high honors. While he was in school, he falls in love with the daughter of a well-known naval captain, and they become engaged to be married. Not long before the wedding, William has an eye surgery, cutting edge, in the hope that the operation would again restore his sight. If it failed, the determination from the doctor is that he would remain blind the rest of his life. William insisted on keeping the bandages on his face until his wedding day. If the surgery was successful, he wanted the first person he saw to be his bride. The wedding day arrived. The many guests, including royalty, cabinet members, distinguished men from England, women of society, they all assembled together to witness this exchange of vows. William's father, Sir William Hart Dyke, and the doctor who performed the surgery stood next to him, his eyes still covered with bandages. The organ trumpeted the wedding march. The bride slowly walked down the aisle to the front of the church. As soon as she arrived at the altar, the surgeon took a pair of scissors and he cut the bandages from William's eyes. Tension filled the room. The congregation of witnesses held their breath as they awaited to find out if William could see the woman who was his bride-to-be. As he stood face to face with his bride, the bandages were loosed. William's words echoed throughout the church that morning. You are more beautiful than I ever imagined. One day, saints, the bandages will be removed from our eyes. One day we will stand face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will exclaim, you are more beautiful than I ever imagined. His glory will be far more splendid than we ever thought possible. We will likely feel that less than one one thousandth of who He is in His beauty had been made known to us in this life. This is the surpassing beauty of one greater than Solomon. Thirdly, necessity was the word that I gave. The necessity of seeking the Lord and believing Him. This is what the Queen of the South shows us. She hears a report from a distant land. She doesn't necessarily believe it all. Sounds too fanciful. I can't even imagine there is such a king in the earth. But I must go to see him. Whatever it costs me, however long the journey is, I must go and see him. And when she gets there, she doesn't reject. She doesn't despise. She doesn't minimize but she is grateful to the point of giving vast wealth as a gift to the point of her exclamation, you surpass the reports that I heard. She embraces it all. And this is the Queen of the South that Jesus gives us as an example. The necessity of seeking the Lord and of believing Him. This phrase in verse 42, three words, for she came, they just struck my heart. 
over the past week. For she came. She traveled a long distance to hear Solomon's wisdom, to see him for herself. For she came. She overcomes a hundred hindrances, a thousand hindrances, leaving her own kingdom to come and see Solomon. For she came. In response to hearing about a lesser light, she came. No invitation. No promised reception. But she came. She could say, I didn't believe the reports, but I knew I had to come. And now that I've come, I'm amazed and believe it all. Let's contrast together the Queen of Sheba and the unbelieving Jews. Queen travels a long, dangerous journey while the Jews were nearby. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 26, day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. Secondly, she came to listen to what is ultimately, though a great vessel, an imperfect vessel. And we that know Solomon understand what that means. Yet the unbelieving Jews had access to God in the flesh. One not just greater than Solomon, but infinitely greater than Solomon. One who was perfection. Third, she had only heard second-hand reports. Yet the unbelieving Jews had the long enjoyment of the Scriptures as God's covenant people. They had many religious advantages. This is what Paul describes in Romans 9. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, so on and so forth. All the religious advantage in the world. And here comes Emmanuel, and they reject Him. She had no invitation to come. And they had the pleadings and invitations of the Messiah. She saw much more in Solomon than what had been reported. And the unbelieving Jews see much less in Jesus than what He was saying and what He was living among them. They condemned Him. She praised Solomon. Sixthly, she gave of her wealth great gifts, being so grateful because Solomon had received her, had taught her, had listened to her. The unbelieving Jews are busy plotting to kill the God-man in their midst. The final analysis is this. The Queen of the South sought out Solomon and embraced his wisdom and his greatness. And the unbelieving Jews rejected and despised the King of the universe who had come to them. He came unto His own, and His own believed Him not. While the Queen hastens to Solomon, the unbelieving Jews withdraw from Jesus. The Queen of Sheba travels far and knocks on Solomon's door for reception. The Jews had Jesus among them, knocking at their door, and they would not open and they would not listen. An anonymous early church father said, she merely hearing of Solomon's reputation desired to see him. They, witnessing the truth of Christ, walked away. Fourthly, finally, urgency. Where's the urgency in the text? Jesus uses plain language. He introduces verse 42 by saying, the Queen of the South will what? Rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Why? Because they are guilty of not seeking the Lord and not believing Him. They are guilty of rejecting the Messiah that had come to seek and to save that which was lost. And this is the attitude in our day. Why urgency? Because there's a coming judgment. 
The attitude among men seems to be, I have plenty of time. My judgment day may be someday, but it's not today. But time is fleeting. Tomorrow is not promised. And the text clearly states that there is a judgment day coming. Jesus says, remember the Ninevites, remember the Queen of the South, and unbelieving Jews, picture them standing there at your condemnation, pointing the finger. Why? Because you would not repent. Why? Because you did not seek the Lord. Why? Because you did not believe in the Gospel. This is what Jesus is urging upon His hearers. This is the context of the passage. It's as though Jesus in John 28 or John 8, excuse me, 24, is saying, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. If you will not repent and believe the Gospel, if you will not be saved, if you would rather die in your sins, then this is the very thing you should expect. The Queen of the South will be pointing at you. But won't you turn to Christ today? Won't you believe? Are not His invitations warm and full of tenderness? Is not He as ready to be received today as He was 2,000 years ago? Does Jesus Christ not receive sinful men? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I'm going to close with a paragraph from Charles Spurgeon. His appeal is my appeal, and he could say it ten times better. I wish you would come and try Christ with your hard questions, as the Queen of Sheba did Solomon. Come and see whether He can forgive great sins. Come and see whether He can help you in great trials. Come and bring to Him your great doubts and grievous distresses. Come and tell Him of your despair and your horrible thoughts and the blasphemous questions that creep through your mind. Come and see whether He is a Savior able to save you. It will be a new thing if Jesus would have to say, you are beyond my power. You have sinned beyond the reach of my love. Come and try Him, I say with your hardest question and most difficult case, and you shall only prove the truth of His Word. He that comes to Me, I will never cast out. Come to Jesus, the One greater than Solomon. Come today. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. And He will receive you in His arms. Amen.